it reasonably well, actually, for some time now. But um, th th these are what the official um, doctors are saying, the professors and things. Common, common cold influenza, HIV, measles, malaria, tuberculosis, all endemic. Smallpox was, of course, but that's been eradicated. So we have lots of other endemic diseases, and it can cause significant problems. I mean, measles, last time I checked, um, measles was the seventh most common cause of death in children in the world, in poorly vaccinated areas especially. So um, endemic does not mean not severe, um, by no means. It just means it's there all the time and pops up from time to time. Tuberculosis, big problem, lots of tuberculosis in poorer areas of the country. So we're going to enter a new endemic uh, COVID era. This is what I believe is going to happen. Now, is this just me or of other academics uh, or, or professional people who do this all the time? Um, uh, do, do they agree with this now? Well, th th they're coming around to it. Professor Julian His Hiscox, Chair of Infectious Global Health in Liverpool, uh, U UK new and emerging respiratory viruses <laughs> new and emerging respiratory virus threats advisory group so th in other words uh, this professor is a member of the UK government officially uh, official advisory group on new uh, viruses which of course was set up uh, in the uh, in response uh, to the pandemic rather than being proactively set up uh, so anyway, as Professor saying, we're almost there now. It's the beginning of the end, at least in the UK, we, we agree. And in fact, we're, we're, we're into the end game now, I believe. I think life in 2022 will be almost back to before the pandemic, I agree. Uh, should a new variant or old variant come along, for most of us, like any other common cold coronavirus, you'll get sniffles and a bit of a headache, and then we are okay, because we have such high levels of immunity. Um, if you're willing to tolerate zero COVID deaths from COVID, then we're facing a whole raft of restrictions, and it's not game over. And I don't want to misrepresent here what Professor um, Professor Hiscox is saying, so I'll put it as a direct quote. But what he's saying is, what he actually means here, that if the government wants zero COVID, then we're going to have big problems. We have to have massive restrictions if we want zero COVID. But if people aren't exposed to the ongoing Omicron, they're not going to develop immunity to it. So, so, so basically what he's saying is we have no choice. The government governments cannot opt for zero COVID. In China at the moment, they're trying to. Uh, let's be quite clear about it. The zero COVID policy in China will fail. It is not possible with Omicron to have a zero policy. Everyone in China is going to be exposed to uh, Omicron in the next few months unless the country is uh, completely closed down, but then we'll get deaths from starvation and all sorts of other problems. It is inevitable. We have to accept the circulation of Omicron. It would uh, be nice not to have it, but you know, we have to accept the circulation of the common cold. You know, there's nothing we can do about it. We can't say, wow, all colds have disappeared. It just can't happen. Um, so I think, I think that's, yeah. that's what he's saying there. So it's not game over if we want to go for zero COVID, but we can't. In a bad flu season, two to three hundred die a day over winter, and nobody wears a mask or socially distanced. And, and this is true. We, we, why have we been tolerating this for so long? All we've been doing is kind of promoting vaccination programs. Um, and that's perhaps a line to draw in the sand, two to three hundred deaths a day. Is that what we're prepared to accept? Probably. Um, but, but, but it's not quite as callous as that. Let, let's go and see what other um, scientists are thinking, see if their thinking is coming round. Uh, this is uh, doc, uh, Dr. Uh, Dora Pelly, a virologist at George's University, uh, who is uh, very optimistic. We'll soon be in a situation where the virus is circulating. We will take care of people at risk, but for anyone else, uh, we accept we will catch it. They will catch it. Well, I agree completely. And your average person will be fine. Yeah, it is it, quite inevitable. So interesting to see all these people are now coming down to what we've been saying for five or six weeks. We need to accept the fact that our flu season is also going to be a coronavirus season, I agree at least for the next few years, and it's going to be a challenge for us. However, it is still uncertain how bad winters will be. The people who die from flu 
the comment tend to be the same, and, and I put a note there, you, you can't die twice. So the people that are vulnerable, that are more likely to die from COVID, are perhaps the people that have been dying from flu, influenza, and its complications in previous years. Um, it's the same basic people that are at risk. And as, as uh, COVID becomes endemic and Omicron becomes endemic, then perhaps the risks are going to be comparable. So I'm not expecting a doubling of, of death rates. I'm not expecting the deaths from influenza to be added to the deaths from uh, COVID because it's the same group of people that are vulnerable and any one individual can only die once. Therefore, they can't appear in the figures twice. And we're not going to lose more people than we otherwise would, would be with hope. And I think that actually makes quite a lot of sense. Um, Professor uh, Gani, <laughs> I should have practiced all these names, shouldn't I? Uh, anyway, epidemiologist in Imperial College London. COVID will still be around, uh, but we're no longer going to need to restrict our lives. I think we can get back to normal soon. It seems like it's taken a long time, but only a year ago we started vaccination and we we're already an awful lot freer because of that. That's true, that's true, it just seems like a long time. It's only a year, just over a year since we started vaccination. Uh, and a new variant can out, uh, a new variant that can outcompete Omicron and be more pathogenic is possible, but it is not likely. Because to have a variant which was even more pathogenic than Omicron Sorry, sorry, even more, so forget that last sentence. To, 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 have, to have a variant which is more transmissible than Omicron is remarkably unlikely. And the probability that you would get something that was more transmissible than Omicron, that, that had immune escape from previous immunity and was more pathogenic, the, the probability of all of those three mutations happening in the same virus is so unlikely. And probably, is not genetically possible, probably not genetically possible. So I think the sheer transmissibility of the Omicron variant is going to protect us from future variants for a period of time. I am optimistic about that. Uh, Professor Eleanor Riley, Immunologist, University of Edinburgh. Uh, when Omicron has finished and moved through, immunity in the UK will be high at least for a time. But there you go. I mean, so basically, the, the, all the main brains are now agreeing um, to be quite honest with what we've been saying for, for some time about the optimism of Omicron. Now, just a couple of your experiences here. Um, I'm not going to uh, mention the name, but someone who describes himself as being 70 years old, overweight male, who used to smoke for a lot of years. Uh, Hi, John, I'm going through a period of suffering. Sorry to hear that. Um, got the infection last Tuesday. Uh, tested on Wednesday and was positive. It is what you describe, but the sore throat is terrible. You don't realise how often you swallow and how much it hurts until it's torture to do so. I've been taking my D3 and zinc, which is good. And uh, quite a touching comment here. Uh, and if nothing else, my new uh, granddaughter will get to know her granddad which of course is the way it should be. What quite a lot of people are telling me, as you said in your experiences, quite a lot of people are saying they actually get better for a while and then get worse. So it seems to follow, you know, they'll wake up in the morning and not feel too good, then they'll, lunchtime they'll feel pretty good. I uh, think, oh, I'm over this. But then by, by bedtime they can be feeling pretty rough again. So um, it does seem to follow this relapsing and remitting course usually but for a fairly short period of time. Uh, now let, let's go on to uh, uh, m m m Miss N place. Um, when, I, uh, when I woke up and feeling like I had a hangover, I immediately took my temperature and sure enough it was 37.8. So woke up just feeling pretty rough as if she'd had a, a bit of a heavy night. Knew I had it, just needed confirmation, performed a lateral flow test and bang, had a positive result in under five minutes. No really, out, no really outstanding symptoms, no sore throat, no real headache, just the tightness of the head, just like a hangover. Temperature fluctuated hour to hour. 
taste buds altered but no loss just altered basically a, a general feeling of being unwell but resolved uh, i haven't got the next piece of paper but from what i remember it resolved in, in about three days so there you go um good to get some of your experiences what we are seeing with omicron is a fairly variable a fairly very some of you haven't quite had a rough time Other, others uh, are um, minimally symptomatic um I, I assume i've had it because i've been exposed uh, maybe just asymptomatically uh, all the time i've done the test i've it's never come up on a test so i've never tested when i've been uh, when i've been positive but but um Quite a few of you are are, 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 are reporting these symptoms. The 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 uh, the, the, COVID, the very COVID symptoms, traffic symptoms, do seem to be pretty accurate. But some of you are feeling pretty rough, uh, ill. Uh, some of you actually feel pretty awful for for uh, a few days. But most people do seem to be recovering quickly. And we know from official data that hospitalisations and intensive care and deaths are way lower, as we saw on those graphics, than previous. Waves. So really, really useful graphics. Those. I think. I think that's um, that actually really helps quite a bit. That it just puts it into context of how uh, lucky we are that this is so less pathogenic. Uh, how fortuitous it, fortuitous it is that it's giving back protection against Delta, and therefore because people who have had Omicron are immune to Delta. Delta is essentially almost, almost gone now. It's just a, a, a percent, a few percent, uh, and it will be gone completely in the next uh, week or two. And do remember, a lot of the problems that we're having with current hospitalizations and deaths are hangovers uh, from, from the from the previous Delta wave that we experienced. So um, reasons to be optimistic and good to see that lots of uh, professors and doctors of immunology and virologists are now uh, agreeing which of course is uh, good okay thank you for watching
Welcome back, it's still Wednesday, the 17th of November. A little more detail on this paper we've been looking at here that's showing that uh, high levels of vitamin D in the blood could be protective against severe illness and uh, death. And uh, some pretty convincing data, really. Now, before we get down to this, one of the headlines on the last video was that these paper authors are saying that we need higher levels of vitamin D when we don't get the sunshine, 4 to 10,000. 4,000 to 10,000 international units of vitamin D per day. <laughs> Extra, if you live in the north of England like me and you're not getting any sun. Uh, and that should be taken with 200 micrograms of vitamin K2, is what these authors are suggesting. Now, I've just been reading some of your comments on the first part of the video. And a lot of people you, uh, a lot of people have said, well, there's no money in vitamin D. It's generic. You can make, you can make it really cheaply. It's, um, it's not a problem. Um, you can't really sell it and make a lot of money on it. Therefore, pharmaceutical companies probably wouldn't be too interested in running expensive trials on it, which is probably true. But you have, so others have said we do need an interventional trial, and we do, and really the question has to be asked is why have we not had a, a large-scale interventional trial on something which is potentially so efficacious and so cheap? Both, uh, both quite interesting questions, to be quite honest. So this is the paper. We're going to carry on looking at it now. And some pretty interesting mm -hmm. things about general mm -hmm. health here as well as specifically covid now, they point out deficiency of vitamin D limits the performance of uh, systems in the body, resulting in increased spread of the diseases of civilization. Now, these are diseases like obesity, um, high blood pressure, diabetes, and again, these do seem to be more common in areas where there's low vitamin D. Certainly, vitamin D deficiency can lead to high blood pressure, and we know that that is a significant COVID risk, for example. So a lot of diseases of civilization, cancer of the colon, ischemic heart disease, a lot of these do seem to be related to low levels of vitamin D and also reduce protection against infection and these papers, this paper saying reduced effectiveness of the vaccine. Now I've been asked this an awful lot. We know that uh, low levels of vitamin D mean that the immune system doesn't work as well. Does that mean the vaccine doesn't work as well? And that is, this is saying, yes, that if people do have low levels of vitamin D and they're vaccinated, then the vaccine probably won't work as well. They won't generate such a good immune response. So another reason, another reason to have good levels of vitamin D. Now, COVID fatality rates, COVID fatality rates correlate with the elderly who might live in a facility where they don't get out very much. Uh, the elderly do tend to stay at home a lot. They don't get the sunlight, therefore they are lower in vitamin D. And we know from large-scale epidemiological studies that older people are lower in vitamin D, as are people with dark-coloured skins. Because the darker the colour of the skin, the more slowly you'll make vitamin D. And we know that people with darker-coloured skins, living in a particular latitude in North America or north of England or wherever it is, darker-coloured skins, people do have lower levels of vitamin D. Um, comorbidities, well, COVID fatalities correlate with comorbidities, but there again, as we've just noticed, a lot of comorbidities correlate with low levels of vitamin D. So what is the absolute prime cause then? Of course, vitamin D levels go way down in winter when we don't make the sun, and the sun doesn't make the vitamin D in the skin, and um, when do we get more colds and influenza and COVID outbreaks? It's in it's in, it's in winter time, of course. So blood levels of 20 nanograms a mil, that's 50 nanomoles a litre. It's that's, that, 20 nanograms a mil, is exactly the same as 50 nanomoles a litre. Sufficient to stop osteomalacia. Now, osteomalacia is the softening of bones. Now, what used to happen, particularly in children, was the bones were soft, and especially the weight-bearing bones, they would become bent, and they would get bent legs, bent long bones. Bow-legged, we used to call this. And uh, that was caused by the, um, the, the lack of vitamin D, meaning that the bones were, um, uh, the bones had osteomalacia. 
but you can prevent rickets with just a, a relatively low level, 20 nanograms per minute is enough to prevent rickets. But what we're saying here is that to prevent other things, you need much higher levels. So rickets is protected first before we're protected from other things. These authors are saying it's preferable to have 40 to 60 nanograms per mil. That's 100 to 150 nanomoles per litre. And they're also saying that to get those kind of levels, you need to be taking six to 10,000 units of vitamin D per day to get up to those kind of levels because we're not making it from the sunshine. We're not out in the sunshine all day. Now, there's vitamin D receptors now, definitely in bone, of course, but also the intestine. Throat. So we know, for example, that low levels of vitamin D are correlated with higher levels of um, colon cancer. So these vitamin D receptors are actually all over the body. The, the activated form of vitamin D is a widespread hormone acting on many different parts of the body. Um, vitamin D recept receptors in the pancreas. Again, low levels of vitamin D are associated with prostate cancer, and people that have had prostate cancer seem to do better if we bunk up their levels of vitamin D. Such a simple intervention. Why isn't this being done? It's so simple to do. And immune system cells all seem to have vitamin D receptors, all of them. And vitamin D is also a powerful epigenetic regulator. Now, epigenetics is kind of complicated, but what, what epigenetics means is that we're born with a certain set of genes, but the way that we live, we can't change that set of genes that you're born with. That's determined at the moment that the sperm met the egg, when you're a zygote, at the point of conception. That can't be changed from that point on, but the, the genes which are switched on and off are influenced by the environment in the uterus and the environment after uterus, or when you're born, in other words, and, and these are epigenetic factors. So epigenetics is the way genes are kind of turned on and off, and vitamin D is important to turn on good genes, is what this is saying. It's an important epigenetic regulator, influencing more than 2,500 genes. Now, this is incredible. Active in any one human being, you've probably got about 21,000 active genes. It was a very big surprise when we found out there were so few active genes. We had thought there was at least 100,000 active genes in people, but with the advent of the Human Genome Project, we now know there's only about 21,000 genes. So we see about 10% or more, more than 10% of genes require vitamin D for their normal activation, the hormonal form of vitamin D, which is derived from the vitamin D from the diet and from the sunlight. This is how important this is because, of course, we are tropical creatures. We are, we are uh, evolved, designed for the uh, to live in the sunshine and evidence of that coming up as well. Um, so um, genetics, of course, it's mutations that cause cancer, so there's increased cancer risk. Diabetes mellitus, especially type 1, the autoimmune diabetes mellitus is associated with low levels of vitamin D, but probably diabetes 2 as well. Definitely acute respiratory tract infections are more common in low vitamin D. And viral lung infections that cause acute respiratory distress syndrome, particularly. So way, be, way before COVID, it was known that um, people are more likely to develop acute respiratory distress syndrome, where the alveoli fill up with fluid, which is a big problem in COVID, of course. It was known that people with high levels of vitamin D are protected against that, regardless of the vi viral cause of that illness. So this, this is not particularly new. Chronic inflammatory diseases like rheumatoid arthritis, low vitamin D is a problem. Autoimmune diseases like thyroid disease, diabetes mellitus, ulcerative colitis, Crohn's disease, all of these are more of a problem in low levels of vitamin D. And multiple sclerosis is a big one now. I mean, multiple sclerosis, we've always known that it's less common near the equator, or especially if people were brought up near the equator. And now hundreds of people have written to me saying that they are so much better. Uh, their multiple sclerosis is so much better now they're taking comparatively high doses of vitamin D. So it, obviously it would have been better to take it from childhood and probably hopefully prevent the vitamin, the, 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 vitamin, the, the, the lack of vitamin D deficiency will prevent the multiple sclerosis, but that's too late now. But if the multiple sclerosis is already there, the vitamin D does seem to um, help. It's an immunomodulatory property. It's an immunomodulator. In other words, if there's not enough immunity, vitamin D will turn immunity up. 
if there's too much immunity causing inflammation, vitamin D will turn it down. It's like a kind of homeostasis. We don't want too much immunity causing inflammation. We don't want not enough, meaning we get rampant infections. And vitamin D just seems to modulate that. It almost brings about a homeostasis of the immune response, which of course is exactly what we want. And it regulates the innate and adaptive immune system. So innate immunity acting against a wide variety of organisms, adaptive immune system, the acquired immune system, which results in cellular and humoral immunity, as we looked at before. And particularly on that, it's now clear that there's vitamin D receptors in all, in all of the immune cells, it would appear. Certainly, we can say for sure, there's vitamin D receptors in the monocytes which migrate into the tissues and become the macrophages absolutely vital immune cell the big eaters and the macrophages also release a full range of cytokines that coordinate the immune response and the inflammatory response and indeed to a large extent the wound healing response as well the t cells the t lymphocytes the b cells the b lymphocytes so the T uh, cytotoxic cells that will destroy virally infected cells, uh, the T helper cells which will stimulate the B cells, and it's the B cells that produce the antibodies, and all these depend on vitamin D activating receptors within the cells, otherwise they're not going to work properly. The natural killer, the NK cells, these are the large lymphocytes that will again kill virally infected cells and kill cancer infected cells. And the dendritic cells, which actually derive from the monocytes, these dendritic cells that they've got, dendrites are branches, so they're kind of branch cells like that in the tissues. And what, what they are is they're antigen presenting cells. So if there's a virus or something floating past, it's likely to come into contact with a, the dendritic arm of these dendritic cells, and they will then go to the lymph nodes and stimulate the immune response. So that, that, that would be the antigen. So these are antigen presenting cells, absolutely vital for the immune response. And that, that, that they need vitamin D to, to function. So moving on to supplements of vitamin D. Um, now, without calcium supplementation, this is where it gets a bit complicated, but we'll go through it. It is well worth sticking with. Without calcium, uh, without calcium supplementation, in other words, if you're not giving additional calcium, even high vitamin D3 supplement does not cause vascular calcification. So we, if that's the blood vessel there with its walls, we don't want calcium going into the walls of the blood vessel because they would become hard. This does happen, it's called drain pipe arteries. They, they become hard and inflexible like drain pipes and look like drain pipes on x-rays. We don't want that calcification. But what this paper is saying is that if we don't give calcium supplements, even very high levels of vitamin D, does not cause this. Now, it seems that we might have been giving too much calcium for a long period of time. So these are my, my dad's uh, calcium tablets here. Uh, there's, there's different brands available. I mean, they're absolutely huge things. I, I think they contain about a relatively small amount of vitamin D. From memory, I think it might be uh, as low as 400 uh, micrograms of vitamin D, and they contain about a gram, about a gram and a half of calcium. So all of this is nearly all, uh, nearly all calcium. They're like huge things. I mean, look at that. I mean, you couldn't, you couldn't swallow that. You just have to suck them. That's why they're lemon flavoured. Well, I wouldn't eat this now. It does taste a lemon, actually. But I wouldn't take it anyway, because it's just, I don't need the calcium. Have we been giving people far too much calcium? Well, these tablets are just huge. Maybe we have. Because what this is saying is that... Um, we're not going to get this arterial calcification um, as long as the vitamin D is given without the supplementary calcium. So it looks like we might have been giving too much calcium. Because the body is very calcium thrifty. If you've got calcium, it won't start passing it out in the urine. It's going to conserve calcium. Um, if your calcium levels are at all low, it certainly can conserve calcium. Vitamin D3 supplementation in the range of 4,000 to 10,000 international units. Now that's the equivalent of 100 to 250 micrograms. I needed to generate this optimum level, which they're saying is 40 to 60 nanograms of vitamin D in the blood, which is 100 to 150 nanomoles per litre. So basically they're saying you need quite large amounts between 4,000 and 10,000 international units per day to keep your blood levels up at this nice high level. 
that's needed. Now, more than more than 20 um, nanograms per mil не понимаю, я смотрю, не понимаю, что такое is enough может. to prevent это rickets but it seems that these much, <laughs> and, and, and that's, what, that's what the advice has been given on enough to prevent rickets but now we know that vitamin D is involved in so many other things we can now say with some confidence on this paper that this higher range is, is necessary and of course in winter we simply won't make it and what this paper is saying is that these higher doses the 4 to 10,000 units Remember we tapped into an email uh, last year and Anthony Fauci said he was taking 6,000 units a day. And he's a relatively small guy, so you know, a bigger guy might need 10,000. That is, that is quite, quite conceivable. Um, pity it wasn't uh, pushed out on the general population as much as we would have liked it to have been. But at least he was uh, helping his own health by taking 6,000 units a day, which would be good. Anyway... Um, the, the thing that people haven't known about much in the past is the role of vitamin K2. Now, direct quote from this paper. So taking these higher doses, four to 10,000 units of vitamin D a day, has been shown to be completely safe when combined with approximately 200 micrograms of vitamin K2, is what this paper says, direct quote. Now, of course, I can't tell you what to do. We're discussing this paper for academic reasons, but uh, that's interesting. So myself, vitamin K2, of course, is... Uh, Fat soluble. So the fat soluble vitamins are ADEC, A, D, E, and K. Now I am not advertising any brands, but um, th this is just a vitamin K2 I got. It's 600 microgram dose. Um, vit vitamin K is in in available for many other manufacturers. I do not get any. Uh, I don't get any uh, money from any <laughs> any pharmaceutical people uh, for for advertising their drugs. But that's 600 micrograms, so I'm, I'm taking one of those a week. I'm taking an extra 600 micrograms of K2 a week. And the idea with that is that the vitamin K2 will take the calcium. Instead of it high calcium levels going into your blood, uh, the high calcium levels will go into your bone. Uh, or rather, rather, they won't go from your blood into your tissues. Because Живала суть наших мирных инициатив и ждет постатейного письменного ответа уже в ближайшие дни. Это вести недели, и я Дмитрий Киселев. Добрый вечер. Смотрите сейчас.
автоматически. И для этого процесса в пенсионном фонде даже придумали специальное понятие – беззаявительный перерасчет. Выше инфляции и уже с 1 января. Все обязательства, которые мы принимаем, они полностью финансово обеспечены. Все об индексации пенсий из первых рук. Летящие на немыслимой скорости омикрон уже нельзя остановить. Взрывного роста ковида не избежать. Расслабляться и как бы выводить там из оборота койки дополнительно, это пока не время. Но что точно мы знаем про омикрон? У него коэффициент распространения там в пять раз выше, чем у дельта. И как Китай готов защитить от пандемии Олимпийские игры? Еду домой, мама, папа, привет! Миротворцы возвращаются на места службы. Миссия выполнена. Спасибо, Россия. Так чего добивались погромщики и террористы? Боевики надеялись взять власть во всей стране. Первые результаты расследования. Как чувствуют себя в Казахстане русские? Наглядно о весьма замысловатых переплетениях казахско-русской истории. И чем живет большая страна? Кто узурпирует право называться российской интеллигенцией? И что это за письма, где доминанта – ненависть к России? Именно от этого так корежит украинских националистов. И именно за это поднялся в 2014 году Донбасс. Подвигу молодой гвардии 80 лет. Григорий Вдовин о том, как в Краснодоне хранят память о героях. Первое и очень яркое впечатление от Ямала – это оленик прямо у дороги, несмотря на проносящиеся мимо автомобили. Волшебный край. Здесь и главные запасы газа, что питают пол мира, и первозданная красота природы. Мне показалось, что мальчик. Как в зоне эпичной мерзлоты налажена полноценная жизнь. Главное международное событие уходящей недели – грозь переговоров России сразу на трех площадках. С Америкой в Женеве, с НАТО в Брюсселе – и с ОБСЕ в Вене. По сути, это еще не были переговоры в полном смысле этого слова. Скорее, разжевывание позиций по новой архитектуре глобальной безопасности, которую президент Владимир Путин и предлагает совместно определить. Главное в ней – разойтись миром. США и НАТО для этого должны прекратить силовую экспансию в сторону России. Снизить военную активность у нашей границы и дать нам соответствующие письменные гарантии. Проект наших договоров с Америкой и НАТО еще до Нового года опубликован. Сейчас наши дипломаты в подробностях донесли все устно. Если по-простому, то Москве надоело. На предновогодней большой пресс-конференции Путин говорил об этом так. Вопросы по обеспечению безопасности. Поэтому нам важен не ход переговоров, нам важен результат. Ну, разве мы не знаем? Я же много раз уже об этом сказал. И вы наверняка знаете хорошо. Ни одного дюйма на восток сказали нам на, на, в 90-е годы. Ну и чего? Надули. Просто нагло обманули. Пять волн расширения НАТО. И теперь уже, пожалуйста, в Румынии, сейчас в Польше появляются соответствующей системы. Вот о чем речь. Ну поймите же вы в конце концов. Не мы кому-то угрожаем. Мы что ли пришли туда к границам США? Или к границам Великобритании? Или куда? К нам пришли. И теперь еще говорят, нет, теперь и Украина будет в НАТО. Значит и там будут системы. Или, бог с ним, не в НАТО, а на двусторонней основе будут. Базы и ударные системы вооружения. Ну вот о чем идет речь. А вы требуете от, от, от меня каких-то гарантий. Вы должны нам дать гарантии. Вы. И немедленно. Сейчас. Из этого следует, что подкладывать нам новую спящую красавицу не надо. Спящие красавицы называли в свое время венские переговоры об обычных вооруженных силах в Европе. Они шли целых... 17 лет, с 1973 по 1990 год. А дипломаты, что начинали те самые венские переговоры, к их концу уже успели состариться. Сейчас другие скорости. Москва ждет подробного письменного ответа на наши мирные инициативы уже на следующей неделе. Замотать и заболтать не получится. 
Пока у дипломатии есть шанс. Если шанс на равную безопасность будет упущен, то придется опереться на принцип равной опасности. Но это не наш выбор. Из Женевы и Брюсселя наш европейский корреспондент Анастасия Попова. Отношения между Россией и Западом находятся на критически низком уровне, а ситуация настолько напряженная, что трехдневный переговорный марафон расценили как... как последнее предложение секундантов помириться перед дуэлью. Дальнейшие шаги Запада и пересечение российских красных линий вынудят Москву разговаривать уже другим языком. Речь о военно-технических мерах, ведь на кону национальная безопасность России. Я хотел бы сказать, что наше предложение носит комплексный характер. Вообще, если говорить о безопасности, я думаю, что российские журналисты меня поймут, это ну, не, не Чугуевская филармония, понимаете, здесь играем, здесь не играем, здесь а, селедку заворачиваем. А, поэтому все элементы нашего предложения, они абсолютно взаимосвязаны. Первое и главное, юридически подкрепленный отказ НАТО от расширения на восток, не размещение ударных вооружений и прекращение освоения территорий, вступивших в Североатлантический альянс после 1997 -го года. Российская позиция открыта, требования опубликованы заранее. Американцы ведут себя скрытно. Внутри их миссии, где проходили переговоры, журналистов на входе буквально раздели. Запретили проносить не только мобильные телефоны, но даже часы. Туалеты вон там, сейчас мы принесем вам воду и кофе. За напускным внешним пафосом журналисты разглядывали главное – состав делегаций. Внушительное количество специалистов из всех сфер – указывала на то, что переговоры тщательно готовили. Рябков и Шерман поздоровались сухо и на 8 часов закрыли двери. Работающую все это время на улице при нулевых температурах прессу отогревал горячими напитками представитель швейцарского МИД. А что у вас тут? Чай, кофе для журналистов, которые здесь еще с ночи и очень замерзли. Специальный, чрезвычайный ввиду важности обмен мнениями завершился точно по расписанию. Американцы нашу делегацию не удивили. Выдвинули в ответ все те же претензии о передвижении войск вдоль нашей же границы и потребовали вернуть части обратно в казармы. Будто вся проблема именно в этом. По крайней мере так в один голос дело представляли западные журналисты. Знаете, как вот сыр Рокфор такой слегка вонющий. Вот чем занимается Блумберг, подавая российскую позицию. We are fed up. Нас достали пустые слова, полуобещания. Мы не доверяем той стороне, требуем легальные гарантии. Absolutely mandatory. Абсолютно необходимо добиться того, чтобы Украина никогда, Ukraine never, never ever, никогда не стала членом НАТО. Мы дали ясно понять, и мы снова прямо сказали об этом русским сегодня, что если Россия дальше будет вторгаться в Украину, за это будет существенная цена, и последствия будут гораздо значительнее, чем те, что были в 2014 году. Ключ к деэскалации в руках Украины, добавил Рябков. Ситуация начнет улучшаться, когда Киев перестанет игнорировать Минские соглашения. Пресс-конференция длится уже час. Вопросы дали задать каждому журналисту, кто сидит за этим столом.
даже тем, кто беспрестанно нагнетал истерию, говоря о кровавой бане и мнимом нападении России. Европейская пресса не хочет нас понять, потому что не видит ситуацию комплексно, считает автор книги «Запад России. Тысячелетняя война» Гимми Мы не хотим учитывать глобальную проблему европейской безопасности, поэтому мы все время указываем пальцем на Украину, говоря, что Россия только и мечтает, что восстановить царскую или советскую империю. Мы исключаем все остальные озабоченности России, например, ту же безопасность. А существует ли эта проблема безопасности для европейцев? Для европейцев есть риск, что внезапно разразится конфликт гораздо большего масштаба, чем тот, что на Донбассе. Тем более, что НАТО не намерен отказываться от приема новых членов. Бывший генсек Альянса Андерс Фолк Расмуссен подстрекает еще и Швецию и Финляндию подать запрос на вступление, обещая принять их уже на следующий день. А пока... Наращивается активность Альянса на Украине. Мы осуществили крупнейшее усиление нашей коллективной обороны за последнее поколение. Вы говорили о деэскалации и о российских войсках на российской территории. Вы действительно считаете, что новые военные учения и отправка оружия на Украину, которая является чужой для союзников по НАТО на данный момент территории, действительно ли вы считаете, что это способствует деэскалации? Этот кризис создала Россия, и поэтому важно, чтобы она осуществила деэскалацию. Впрочем, на заседании 30 членов Альянса главу нашей делегации в Брюсселе Александр Грушков принимали нарочито тепло. Называли другом, протягивали кулак. Его же показала глава американской делегации Венди Шерман. В ответ Грушков предложил ей рукопожатие. После небольшой заминки она его приняла. Вне зала атмосфера была иной. К российской прессе на этой встрече отношения особенные. Всем журналистам, даже обладателям годовых пропусков, выдали вот такие одноразовые, которые отличаются по цвету. Есть зеленый, желтый и красный. Этот значит не шагу без сопровождения. Ходили по пятам, следили за каждым шагом. В зале, где разместили нашу прессу, тоже сидел надзорный. Снимать все это запретили. Уточнили, что подозрения нынче вызывают все гости из России. Генеральный секретарь расширил тему, сказав, что и российским миротворцам нигде не рады. То ли дело НАТО – уничтожение Югославии. Бомбят, значит, защищают. Вы знаете, Югославия распалась не из-за НАТО. Были внутренние причины, по которым Югославия распалась. НАТО вошла гораздо позже в соответствии с мандатом ООН, чтобы остановить зверство в Боснии и Герцеговине. Так что сама мысль о том, что НАТО использовала военную силу для изменения границ на Балканах, неверна. Возможно, моя память подводит меня, но, насколько я помню, сила НАТО вошла...